Welcome to a masterclass about a big topic and a controversial one at that within the context of screenwriting. We're talking about dialogue, We're talking about masters of dialogue. I'm focusing on one in particular, and I'll let you guess who that may be. Is it Quentin Tarantino? Is it Phoebe Waller-Bridge? Is it Billy Wilder? Is it Aaron Sorkin? Is it David Mamet or still someone else? We'll focus on one of these and give you a little bit about that process. And we'll be analyzing two popular scenes. Hang tight. I'm no dialogue expert. I've co-written an action film, war film, a Danger Close. And one of the writers on the team was my mentor when it comes to um, dialogue writing, that's Jack Brisley, who prepared this class incredibly well. He wrote a plus 100 page manual on dialogue writing, and I will share that with you. So because you're students of the masterclass, I will email you that book after today's class. Now, this is the opening from Jack's book. He says the mainstream screenwriting books seem to gloss over dialogue. Sid Field devotes only 8 out of 309 pages to dialogue in screenplay. Robert McKee's story has 7 out of 419 pages devoted to dialogue. And Blake Snyder's Save the Cat, Build Us, the last book on screenwriting that you'll ever need, has none. Meanwhile, Robert McKee has published a book specifically on dialogue, so you should check that out. Now let's go to McKee and listen to what are his three primary rules or qualities of dialogue that will help you with writing dialogue that's functional for the screen. First, compression and economy. Screen dialogue must say the maximum in the fewest possible words. Second, direction. Each exchange of dialogue must turn the beats of the scene in one direction or another across the changing behaviors without repetition. Third, purpose. Each line or exchange of dialogue executes a step in design that builds and arcs the scene around its turning point. All this precision, yet it must sound like talk, using an informal and natural vocabulary complete with contraction, slang, and even if necessary, profanity. So now you hear it, even the master of teachers says, there uh, may be profanity in your writing, and be warned, there'll be some of that in today's class. Summary of what he just said, three qualities, compression and economy, direction, and purpose. One of the challenges for the screenwriter is to tell the characters apart. In the book, Jack Brisley talks about how Shakespeare scholars uh, claim that if you were to strip the dialogue out of Shakespeare's plays and not show the name of the speaker, you should be able to uh, identify who spoke the line just from how it is spoken, because every character and every person in the real world has their own idiosyncratic way of speaking. We'll get to that in a minute, but I wanted to give you an example of an incredible, an extreme challenge. When you have two characters who belong to pretty much the same demographic, how do you tell them apart? In the next scene from the sitcom Silicon Valley, we have two um, uh, tech nerds arguing with, with one another. And that will be the basis of uh, an exercise we do right after that. So here we have Ehrlich and Richard from the first episode of Silicon Valley. Richard, can I talk to you for a second? Solo. Mm -hmm. We need to talk about Pied Piper. But what about it? Uh, the website's up and running. I'm just redesigning the compression. It just needs users. <laughs> yeah, no shit. But even if somebody wanted to use it, they wouldn't be able to figure out how to. It's incomprehensible. Now, Richard, when you pitched me Pied Piper, you said that it was going to be the Google of music, which is a really rad way to pitch something. I mean, I liked it. I thought it had applications. And no, it has all that. Look, when it blows up, and it, and it will once it reaches a critical mass of users, Pied Piper will be able to search the whole world of recorded music to find out if there's a match, to see if you're infringing on any copyrighted material. So if you're a songwriter or okay, a fan... Okay, first of all, nobody gives a shit about stealing other people's music, okay? Um, Everybody involved in the music industry is either stealing it or sharing it. They're all a bunch of assholes, especially Radiohead. Look, no. Richard, yeah, they're assholes. Now look, Richard, if you want to live here, mm -hmm. 
You've got to deliver. I can't have dead weight at my incubator, okay? Either that or show some promise for fuck's sake. Like Nip Alert, Big Heads app. It gives you the location of a woman with erect nipples. Now that's something people want. Richard, you need to get in touch with humanity. When I sold my company, Aviato, I wanted to give back. That's why I started this place. To do something big, to make a difference. You know, like Steve. Uh, uh, Jobs or Wozniak? Uh, Steve Jobs or Steve? No, I heard you. Which one? Jobs. Well, I mean, Jobs was a poser. He didn't even write code. I mean, you just disappeared up your own asshole. All right, so how do you distinguish between these two characters, Richard and Ehrlich? How do you make them idiosyncratic? How do you make them unique within the world of screen characters just through their dialogue? It's a challenge. And here's a tool that may help you in really labeling every character in the various aspects of their speech. So first of all, we look at their um, their number of words per minute. We call it the verbosity. So Ehrlich is fairly verbose. Richard is a little bit more laconic, although, you know, when he has to defend himself, he's, he's fairly fluent as well. Later, we'll also have the character of Peter. That's for the next clip. Um, do they speak formally? Do they speak informally? Both here, I would say, are informal. Are they direct or indirect? Ehrlich is very direct. Richard is a little bit more indirect because he's shy, and that has to do with confidence. Ehrlich is confident. And you can probably double this list. You could probably find another um, 10 or 15 different factors. Some of these are related to the language. Others are related to the um, the execution, the performance, the delivery, but they're all your territory. Obviously, vocabulary has to do with the words you choose and put in the dialogue element in a screenplay, but everything else, whether the character speaks with, with hesitations, with lots of pauses, the type of intonation, if it's uh, striking, you will write that as a parenthetical or as a note when the character is introduced. So through dialogue, you can really distinguish the characters. And I recommend you, you create a chart like this in order to keep track of how your characters speak. Hi, excuse me, Mr. Gregory. Um, I have a, an idea. I'd love to pitch you if you have time. Ooh. Uh, uh, well, that is before uh, I just give up and go back to college. Don't do not do that. Go work at Burger King. Go into the woods and forage for nuts and berries. Do not go back to college. I think I have been played. Fine. Go ahead and pitch. You have until I fasten the seat belt in my car. Thank you so much. Uh, a Pied Piper is a proprietary site that lets you find out if your music is infringing on any existing copyrights. So imagine you're a songwriter, okay? I don't think I could write a song. Yeah, no, just look, imagine if you were. I don't even think I could say Pied Piper is a proprietary site. Well, I just did, but it wasn't easy. Is a figure of speech, or at least a, a technique, of making a dialogue sound more unified it's taking a word and throwing it back to the speaker here um, he started with um, imagining and then um, you know that that line of dialogue also at that point Richard was Richard's dialogue was getting quite long at that point some viewers may have started to zone out and it was interrupted by uh, Peter's character interesting if you look at the script for this particular passage you, you'll or rather the previous passage the the speech um, on stage, you'll see that about half of what was scripted was not spoken. And I was wondering why that, obviously it's very common that this, this happens. Now here, the chunks were quite significant. And then I realized that the character Peter Gregory puts in a lot of pauses. So the dialogue took a lot longer than you would typically expect in a sitcom. Now in order to still stick to the duration of that episode, in the edit, they might have had to cut significant portions of it. It's important to realize that dialogue on the page runs for longer than it counts on screen. So the average rule of one page per minute doesn't fully apply for dialogue. You'll typically have a lot more pages uh, than you would have minutes in dialogue, and particularly in fast spoken dialogue in television. There were some alliterations in there now, um, 
It happens very rarely, but sometimes characters go overboard. A vendetta held as a votive, not in vain. For the value and veracity of such shall one day vindicate the vigilant and the virtuous. <laughs> Verily, this vicious swears of verbiage veers most verbose, so let me simply add that it's my very good honor to meet you, and you may call me V. Are you like a crazy person? So let this not be an invitation to you all to write alliterations into your screenplays because your characters will sound like crazy people. Also, because Robert McKee says you shouldn't. Read your dialogue aloud to avoid tongue twisters or accidental rhymes and alliterations, such as, they're moving their car over there. Never write anything that calls attention to itself as dialogue. Anything that jumps off the page and shouts, Oh, what a clever line am I. The moment you think you've written a particularly brilliant and memorable line of dialogue that film lovers will quote with affection for decades to come, cut it. There you hear it. So if you were trying to write that forever memorable quote, forget about it. Sometimes you do want to do it. Sometimes it just happens. And I think most uh, well-known quotes just happened. It's hard to predict when you're writing something that will be remembered. Let's have a look at a few of the best-known quotes and then we'll study them in a few aspects and see what are some of the qualities that come back in each of those quotes. Look, it may take a while. I want to wait. There's a bench over there. I'll be back. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. The Latin term for that sentiment is carpe diem. Now, who knows what that means? Carpe diem. That sees the day. Very good, Mr. Meeks. Meeks. Another unusual name. Seize the day. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Hey, Luke. May the force be with you. What are you looking at? So if you were to look at the qualities of quotes, there is conspicuous concision. There's tremendous tension when they're spoken. They have a memorable meter. And they're simply short. And Lee, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to value your contribution. I'm going to add you, what you brought because some of those, uh, the most memorable quotes, they, uh, they come from the character. I mean, Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Another great example. Sometimes quotes are not just quoted by the fans, they're quoted by other screen dramas. And this is another example. You have meddled with the primal forces of nature, Mr. Hamlin, and I won't have it. Do you want me to call security? It's okay, Brenda, we got it. So another example of where the character is considered a crazy. Interesting about this is it's the lead into a speech in the film Network where Ned Beatty delivers the speech to Peter Finch. 
again, the reason why this is a memorable moment is the incredible tension in which it is delivered. And the, the difference between what we just saw, which is the, the homage in Better Call Saul, the first episode of Better Call Saul, there is no introduction there. And I would say a lot of the audience would probably have had the response same response as Kim Wexler, thinking, is this guy, has this guy gone nuts? Because if you haven't seen Network, it doesn't really make sense. It comes unintroduced uh, more as a surprise. I'll show you where the quote comes from, and um, we'll just show you the beginning of the speech. But what's more important, I'll share with you the introduction, so the build-up of the tension, so we're being prepared for the dialogue to be delivered. And I think that's, that's really important when you are about to deliver dialogue that is critical to your story. You want to first set the scene. You want to give it the, the proper foundation. And here is that clip from Network. Who is it? I'm going to take you into our conference room. Seems more seemly a setting for what I have to say to you. I started as a salesman, Mr. Beal. I sold sewing machines and automobile parts hairbrushes and electronic equipment. They say I can sell anything. I'd like to try to sell something to you. Valhalla, Mr. Beale. Please sit down. Without this prelude, it wouldn't have had its effect. You have meddled with the primal forces of nature, Mr. Beale, and I won't have it. Is that clear? What follows is packed with exposition, and no audience would have swallowed that without this preparation, without first being in this character, sharing his insecurity and now his fear of what is, what is to come. So they've got our attention and we will be open to whatever is following. Now, did you pick up on the alliteration? Um, more seemly a setting for what I'm saying. That was clearly against Robert McKee's advice. Maybe intentional, maybe accidental, who knows. Alliteration is not the figure of speech to go for, but there are tons of other figures of speech that are more effective without drawing as much attention to them. And here's another great example of a very effective figure of speech called the epistrophe. Them clothes got laundry numbers on them. You remember your number and always wear the ones that has your number. Any man forgets his number, spends a night in the box. These here spoons you keep with you. Any man loses his spoon, spends a night in the box. There's no playing grab ass or fighting in the building. You got a grudge against another man, you fight him Saturday afternoon. Any man playing grab ass or fighting in the building spends a night in the box. First bell is at five minutes of eight. When you will get in your box. Last bell is at eight. Any man not in his bunk at eight spends a night in the box. There's no smoking in the prone position in bed. To smoke, you must have both legs over the side of your bunk. Any man caught smoking in the prone position in bed spends the night in the box. Roll call at dusk and dawn. Any prisoner misses roll call spends the night in the box. Prisoners do not speak in the spoken to. Any prisoner talks back spends the night in the box. We get it. Another homage, another quote. This time, Toy Story 3 quoting from Cool Hand Luke. This is a script excerpt from, I was going to say Rear Window. It's not Rear Window. It's North by Northwest. And it is the, uh, I believe it's the first, yeah, it is obviously from the dialogue, the first encounter between Thornhill and the professor. Now, we have seen the character of the professor earlier in the film. Uh, Thornhill was framed. He was set up to... Um, be thought of the, as a, the killer of um, a, a, a UN official. And in this meeting, f he, for the first time, our hero, Thornhill, played by Cary Grant, meets with this character that we saw at the end of Act One who was aware of this whole setup because it was a CIA um, uh, plan. Now, the reason we're showing this clip and this excerpt from the screenplay 
is how this piece of dialogue is being unified. It's, you'll also find it in the example uh, list from Jack Bristley uh, that you'll be sent after this masterclass. So if we look at this, I don't think I caught your name, to which the professor responds with, I don't think I pitched it. So he responds to the word court. Thornhill says, you're police, aren't you? Or is it FBI? Professor throws back the word FBI. CIA, ONI, we're all in the same alphabet soup. Now, Thornhill goes for a different direction, but uses the alphabet soup as the connection with the previous exchange. We know that. Uh, you do, and then we go to the next page where Thornhill asks, where are we going? New York or Washington? Professor says, Rapid City, South Dakota. Again, Thornhill repeats it. Rapid City, what for? It's near Mount Rushmore. I've already seen Mount Rushmore. Uh, so has your friend, Mr. Van Dam. Van Dam, and so forth. So you see how by repeating, by picking up on a word that one character says, the next character creates unity in the dialogue exchange and it gives it a, a very natural feeling flow i don't think i caught your name i don't think i pitched it you're police aren't you or is it fbi fbi cia oni we're all in the same alphabet soup really? well you can stick this in your alphabet soup i had nothing to do with that united nations killing oh we know that you know it then why did you let the police chase me all over the map we never interfere with the police unless absolutely necessary it's become necessary. Oh, I see. And I take it I'm going to be clear. I do wish you'd walk past Mr. Thorny. We'll miss the plane. Well, where are we going? New York or Washington? Rapid City, South Dakota. Rapid City? What for? No, Mount Rushmore. Well, thank you. I've seen Mount Rushmore. Uh, so is your friend, Mr. Van Dam. Van Dam? Uh, a rather formidable kind of gentleman, eh? End of the scene. One of the talking head scenes in uh, North by Northwest, but Hitchcock keeps it moving, as you always should. For that too, we go to Aaron Sorkin. He is the prime example of a writer who keeps the action going while characters talk. Often we have to tell, not show, for budget reasons. It's one of the chapters in Jack's um, seminar bundle, and here's the complete overview that you can work your way through the most important part of dialogue for me is structure. And I have played for you this scene from Charlie Wilson's War many times over. I'm not going to do it today. I'm, I'll just show you the stills and break down how it, is, um, how it is structured. And then we're going to another scene that I haven't shown yet here. And that's the opening scene of The Social Network. Because I do believe that Aaron Sorkin is arguably one of the best people to learn from when it comes to dialogue structure. Often when people <clears throat> like a writer for their dialogue, they think it's about the choice of words or the use of figures of speech, whereas at the core is often a phenomenal grasp of structure. In this scene where Gust Avricados, played by Philip Seymour Hoffman, meets his superior Craigley, Initially, it appears that the conversation is going to be about an apology. Both men think that the other one is going to apologize to them. And that leads to an argument. So that sets up the drama. And we'll hear Sorkin afterwards, uh, as he tells us that one of the most important skills for a screenwriter is to get people to argue in order to be able to deliver what you've got to deliver in the scene. So in that first act of the scene, we were brought to a level of dramatic tension through this misunderstanding about the apology. The first act ends when this maintenance person comes in and this is to replace the glass, or he's just replaced the glass that Gust Africados broke last time he was there to insult his uh, superior. So the end of the first act is action. It is visible physical action in the scene. So it's the end of the pure dialogue. Now, as soon as our maintenance man, man is out of the, the, the office, Gus Avercados starts act two with his clear action, his clear obje uh, obje objective, which is to convince Craigley that he should have received the Finnish station chief job. He argues his point 
using rational means, rational elements. Until the midpoint reversal of the scene, where he asks Craigley, what's the reason? And Craigley says, because you're coarse. Now, that's personal to Gust, because that's not something he has control over, he feels. It's his psychology. And now, halfway the scene, Gust realizes that he may not win this. And now he goes for a personal argument. And he, he basically shows that he had power over Craigley because he knew about an affair that Craigley had. So halfway this conversation, at the end of Act 2A, or if you want the four-act structure within this scene, you could say at the end of Act 2, the dialogue intention, the stakes go up. Now Gust's job is at stake because if he goes and offends his superior, obviously, the, the uh, uh, superior may retaliate. And that's exactly what he says at the end of Act 2. He, he threatens Gust to take his job. At that point, the maintenance man is still standing behind Gust. Gust takes the wench and he breaks the glass second time. The second physical action in the scene, end of Act 2, or if you look at the four-act structure, end of Act 3, just after the lowest point. And this shot, this still you see on the screen here, is where he delivers his final argument. It's the act three of this scene. Now, in the act three, we learn what the scene is really about. The scene is about introducing the character of Gustav Ricardos. And the, the final words he speaks are, I am an American spy. And the whole argument leads up to that statement. So it's a wonderful four-act structure or three-act structure delivered in four minutes, and it seems to be that that's a preferred structure for Sorkin, because when we go to social network, we'll see an almost identical structure in the opening scene between Mark Zuckerberg and his uh, fictitious girlfriend, uh, Erica. So four parts of just under one minute each, and they lead into similar sorts of climaxes. Um, I shall play the, the final act. This is under one minute, I'll play the, the final act of the scene. My loyalty? For 24 years, people have been trying to kill me. People will know how. Now, do you think that's because my dad was a Greek soda pop maker? Or do you think that's because I'm an American spy? Go fuck yourself, you fucking child. And here is Sorkin himself talking about this scene. I, I found that if you can get two characters in a room arguing about something, anything, the correct time of day, uh, uh, you, you're going to uh, put yourself in, in a good place to succeed. Uh, so that's what I wanted to do. Uh, I, had, I had read in the book that, um, uh, that Gust felt cheated because he wasn't given uh, the Helsinki station post job. Um, uh, I, the following things are what I got from the book. That... Uh, um, the fact that he uh, uh, told his boss twice to go fuck himself uh, on, on two different occasions, um, and that as a result of those things and some, uh, and some other more fundamental things, like his blue-collar background, his ethnicity, uh, just the fact that he, uh, he, he wasn't then cut from the, uh, from the CIA mold of, of a more Ivy League thing, that he was very much an outcast uh, uh, at the CIA. So I wanted to... Uh, introduce him like that. And again, I wanted to use a fight. So it'll be about why didn't I get the Helsinki uh, station chief job? And maybe, um, uh, you know, if I write this well enough, if I really get it going, uh, it, it will be a good uh, introductory scene. So I'm glad it worked out. It was a wonderful introductory scene, my favorite scene of the whole movie, and one of the best scenes, I think, performed by Philip Seymour Hoffman. We're going to the social network Remember, that was the number two in the blacklist in 2009, written by Aaron Sorkin, filmed by David Fincher. And I'm going to show you the four acts of that opening scene. It takes nine pages in the screenplay. Don't try this at home, because I think before you can sustain such length of dialogue on the page, you really need to master structure skills to an, an expert level. Um, the scene is... Actually, you know, it doesn't need any introduction. All you need to know is that Mark Zuckerberg at this point was just 
a student. How do you distinguish yourself in a population of people who all got 1600 on their SATs? I didn't know they take SATs in China. They don't. I wasn't talking about China anymore. I was talking about me. You got a 1600? Yes. I could sing in an a cappella group, but I can't Does that sing. mean you actually got nothing wrong? I could row crew or invent a $25 PC. Or you could get into a final club? Or I get into a final club. You know, from a woman's perspective, sometimes not singing in an a cappella group is a good thing. This is serious. On the other hand, I do like guys who row crew. Well, I can't do that. I was kidding. And yes, I got nothing wrong with the test. Have you ever tried? I'm trying right now. To row crew? To get into a final club. To row crew? No. Are you like, whatever, delusional? Maybe it's just sometimes you'd say two things at once. I'm not sure which one I'm supposed to be aiming at. But you've seen guys who row crew, right? No. Okay, well, they're bigger than me. They're world class athletes. And a second ago, you said you like guys who row crew, so I assumed you had met one. I guess I just meant I like the idea of it. You know, the way a girl likes cowboys. Okay. Should we get something to eat? Would you like to talk about something else? No. It's just since the beginning of the conversation about finals club, I think I may have missed a birthday. So the first uh, act of this scene sets up the conflict. What we hear is Erica is hungry. She wants to eat. She's just having conversation with Mark because she likes him. And she's sitting through all his self-centered uh, crap just because, you know, that's what you do in a relationship. But he's pushing it a little bit. And he keeps going on about these final clubs, which is essentially his insecurity. And that will drive the second act of this scene in which he brings back the conversation again. He didn't get the underlying uh, hint that Erica gave him that she would love to talk about other things. And she'll give him a chance because the, the, the scene opens with this statement about the number of people with genius IQ in China. She goes back to that because, you know, if she's going to have conversation instead of eat, she might as well have a conversation about something that they're both interested in. Is it true that they send a bus around to pick up girls who want to party with the next Fed chairman? So you can see why it's so important to get in. Okay, well, which is the easiest to get into? Why would you ask me that? I was just asking. None of them. That's the point. My friend Eduardo made $300,000 betting oil futures one summer, and Eduardo will come close to getting in. The ability to make money doesn't impress anybody around here. Must be nice. He made $300,000 in the summer? He likes meteorology. You said it was oil futures. You can read the weather, you can predict the price of heating oil. I think you asked me that because you think the final club that's easiest to get into is the one where I'll have the best chance. I... What? You asked me which one was the easiest to get into because you think that that's the one where I'll have the best chance. The one that's the easiest to get into would be the one where anybody has the best chance. You didn't ask me which one was the best one. You asked me which one was the easiest one. I was honestly just asking, okay? I was just asking to ask. Mark, I'm not speaking in code. Erica. You're obsessed with finals clubs. You have finals clubs OCD and you need to see someone about it who will prescribe you some sort of medication. You don't care if the side effects may include blindness. Final clubs. Not finals clubs. That's the midpoint reversal of this particular scene. This is where Mark really blows it. At the beginning of this act, um, she wants to, you know, go and have the conversation with him. And he keeps going on about the final clubs, which, um, he, where he ignores the fact that she wants to talk about something different. Then she makes another genuine attempt to make conversation and she goes along and she asks questions about the final clubs. And then she makes that statement, uh, she asks about which one is the easiest to get in, which really triggers his insecurity. And that he's already quite negative in his tone and this, this brings the, the douchebag out and he's going to offend her. So as a result, to, uh, as a response to what he took as an offense, he's now going to offend her and she's not taking that very lightly. She tells him that he's getting obsessed by it. So things get personal. And this is where the relationship now gets uh, in danger. And then we go into this, the third part of the conversation, which is act 2B. It's the darker part of the story. It's where we go to the lowest point. And there's a difference between being obsessed and being motivated. Yes. There is. Well, you do. That was cryptic, so you do speak in code. I didn't mean to be cryptic. I'm just saying I need to do something substantial in order to get the attention of the clubs. Why? Because they're exclusive and fun, and they lead to a better life. Teddy Roosevelt didn't get elected president because he was a member of the Phoenix He was club. a member of the Porcellian, and yes, he did. Well, why don't you just concentrate on being the best you you can be? Did you really just say that? I was kidding. Although, just because something's trite doesn't make it any less I want to true. try to be straightforward with you and tell you that I think you might want to be a little more supportive. If I get in, I will be taking you to the events and the gatherings, and you'll be meeting a lot of people you wouldn't normally get to meet. You would do that for me? We're dating. 
Okay. Well, I want to try and be straightforward with you and let you know that we're not anymore. What do you mean? We're not dating anymore, I'm sorry. Is this a joke? No, it's not. You're breaking up with me? You are going to introduce me to people I wouldn't normally have the chance to meet. What the f... What is that supposed to mean? Wait, settle down. What is it supposed to mean? Erica, the reason we're able to sit here and drink right now is because he used to sleep with the door guy. The door guy? His name is Bobby. I have not slept with the door guy. The door guy is a friend of mine, and he's a perfectly good class of people. And what part of Long Island are you from? Wimbledon? Wait. I'm going back to wait, my door. Wait, wait. Is this real? End of Act 2. It is the end. Uh, this is the lowest point. Uh, Mark is in genuine danger of losing her here. And if we go back to that, what happened to her demeanor in the second half of the scene, it changes completely. Rather than participating and, and you know, going along with him, she almost observes what an absolute asshole he is. And then when he offers to take her to the clubs, if he would get in, she said, you would do that for me. He doesn't even get the sarcasm and, and responds to it. Um, and that leads to the... Uh, the point where Mark realizes he's in trouble and now he needs to save his his ass, basically. And that's going to be the final act, the third act, where he will try and save the relationship. He's going to make an attempt in his own way. And, that, and he uses all the wrong methods, as you can see, brings out his real character. Wait. I'm going back to wait, my door. Wait, wait. Is this real? Yes. Okay, then wait. I apologize, okay? I have to go study. Erica? Yes. I'm sorry, I mean it. I appreciate that, but I have to go study. Come on, you don't have to study. You don't have to study. Let's just talk. I can't. Why? Because it is exhausting. Dating you is like dating a stairmaster. All I meant is that you're not likely to... Currently. I wasn't making a comment on your parents. I was just saying that you go to BU. I was stating a fact. That's all. And if it seemed rude, then of course I apologize. I have to go study. You don't have to study. Why do you keep saying I don't have to study? Because you go to BU. You want to get some food? I am sorry you are not sufficiently impressed with my education. And I'm sorry I don't have a robot, so we're even. I think we should just be friends. I don't want friends. I was just being polite. I have no intention of being friends I'm with you. I'm under some pressure right now from my OS class, and if we could just order some food, I think we should be. Okay, you are probably going to be a very successful computer person. But you're going to go through life thinking that girls don't like you because you're a nerd. And I want you to know from the bottom of my heart that that won't be true. A surprising ending to a great scene. At the same time, also, it sets up the ending of the film, the final image of the film. If you haven't seen it, watch it. If you haven't studied the screenplay, read it. This final act of the dialogue shows how Mark responds, fights to keep her, even goes into a panic, his demeanor com uh, changes completely. And then he veers from scared to overly uh, rude. He backtracks on a few things he said before, be before he makes his final insult, which really shows his genuine character. When he, when he says, you go to be you, that's how he really thinks about her. A wonderful setup, and it shows the structure of this four-minute scene, nine pages in the screenplay. Again, uh, a good one to study. Now, this is the point where I wanted to go back to Aaron Sorkin and <laughs> listen to what is his process, because you want to know how a guy who comes up with this sort of gold, how he works. I do speak out loud, but not into a tape recorder. I, I, as a matter of fact, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a very physical process for me. And if you, if you were peering uh, uh, through my window uh, at my office or at my house, you, you'd call a cop. You'd think I was going nuts uh, because I'm playing all the parts. I'm jumping up and down. I'm all over the room. I'm basically trying to work myself into a lather um, uh, to, uh, uh, to get some kind of energy and passion and argument uh, going in the room. We're almost at the end of today's class, but I wanted to run you through the main points of this uh, dialogue checklist I created a few years back, and um, I've updated it for this particular class. The highlights are, you need to first ask yourself, do you need the dialogue? Because often you can cut entire exchanges, sometimes in our, in our entire dialogue scenes, and often there are better visual ways of telling the story. But as we said previously, out of budgetary constraints, sometimes you have to do the storytelling in the dialogue. Don't ditch description altogether. In that respect, don't look at um, 
uh, Aaron Sorkin and Woody Allen as your examples because they will have whole pages with just dialogue. You need to com continue to be aware that there is a, a, a room that these characters are in or an environment, a setting that the audience sees and they need to be the reader needs to be kept aware of that. And particularly in this scene, um, in the introduction of Gust, you would go to description, obviously, at the end of Act 1 of that scene, and then again at the end of Act 2. Every line really should be a beat. The type of analysis that I just did for the Aaron Sorkin scenes, there's a wonderful analysis Robert McKee did of the, the bazaar scene in Casablanca uh, between Ilsa and Rick, where... McKee also breaks down the various beats in far more detail than I've just done here and with far more aplomb. So check out uh, that analysis. It's in the book and it shows what a beat means and, and how in dialogue you need to be able to deliver beats. That's really your, your job. Every dialogue should really support the overall conflict of the film. Great dialogue therefore carries subtext as we could see in the uh, scenes from Sorkin and you'll see in that analysis by McKee. Exposition is fine. It works in dialogue provided you dramatize it sufficiently. Cut what is redundant. Remember that it, the dialogue is not real conversation. Although the best exercise you can do to get a, a feel for genuine spoken speech is to record real people that don't know they're being recorded and then type it in Final Draft or whatever software you use. Then you can see what real speech looks like. But ultimately, what you're going to keep in your screenplay is not that. You'll need to keep the three rules in mind that McKee gave us at the beginning of this class. And it needs to be stylized to a degree. You can use rhetoric to your benefit with the numerous figures of speech to spice up your dialogue. Don't do talking heads. That's boring. Always keep us aware of the environment. Avoid quotables. I thought I'd fix this one. Um, there should be an S at the end. Don't answer questions. That's a really powerful one, and now I wish I'd spent more time on it. What it means is that when a character poses a question, you create tension. When you immediately answer that question, the tension will be dissolved, and the audience will relax and therefore not be participating as much as they were. So let that question linger for a while, and that will create an ongoing tension. And answer it in a surprising way at a surprising time. Make sure your dialogue supports the scene's rhythm and do read your dialogue for its meter. Can you pronounce it? Is there a certain speakable cadence to it? And in that respect, perfect imperfection because nobody speaks, nobody except for when you listen to Joseph Campbell's speeches, it's incredible how he at the time created these wonderful fully formed sentences full of gold but there are not a lot of people like him that can speak that way. In film, we want to show the imperfection of human speech. So never write lines that are grammatically perfect, but you, you still need to spell it properly because uh, there's, there's no excuse for the, the writer to spell improperly. Now, check out the dialogue checklist. I'll email it to you. And this brings us to the end of today's class. That was a masterclass about dialogue. We have dozens of other topics. And if you want to be there when we run them live for the first time, then have a look at the information below the video and sign up for our weekly masterclasses. If you liked what you saw today, please like, uh, yeah, just hit the like button or better even make sure you don't miss out when the next masterclass goes live and subscribe to this channel. Thank you and see you next time. Bye.